Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today is ACC Sunday. It is also Singapore National Day. We pray for our nation to be stronger, to continue to progress for peace and stability. We pray for a harmonious relationship between every race and unity to face any challenges ahead. In order to build a society with the right value that are aligned with our biblical value. Happy birthday, Singapore. Due to the COVID-19 situation, this year's CSC Sunday is not like previous CSC Sunday. There is no pulpit exchange. This was a decision made after discussion with our district superintendents as we want to prevent any possibility of cross-contact or cross-infection. The DS felt that the most appropriate arrangement was for the president to preach. I accepted their suggestion, and I pray that God will use this message to bless his church. The year 2020 will be a significant year in human history. The sudden onset of the COVID-19 pandemic caught us unprepared. Due to the widely connected transport system and high density living condition, virus spread at a speed far beyond our imagination. Cities in almost every continent were affected, sparing close to no one. The global supply chain was also affected we were left unable to manufacture many goods. Logistic operations were affected worldwide, causing disruption to supply. Economic activities nearly came to a halt, resulting in sudden surge in anxiety. Many businesses were forced to change their mode of operation People shifted to work from home. School closed. Students have to do home-based learning. And most of all, the religion site were closed. This sudden and unexpected change disrupt our usual routine, resulting in many emotional and mental issues. We all experience some form of stress. The COVID pandemic has undoubtedly brought many changes and impacted the life of countless people. Today, I want to share with you three key reflections from church perspective. First, the projected years of transformation within society was compressed and manifested in 2020. Just like a pressure cooker, it could bring a 10 hours cooking time to an hour or two. Frankly, working from home is not a new thing. Online video conferencing was not a new technology revolution. We knew that this form of digital technology would probably have become a norm as more people and company eventually adapted and used all these communication tools. We understood that all of these are part of the progression in the digital frontier, yet we did see some resistance towards adapting them. As we were too used to the old method, they were still working. I think if we wanted everyone to change a lifestyle, I'm not sure if it could take place within 10 years. But the arrivals of COVID-19 pandemic has ironically accomplished that. It has caused all of us to go online in a fuller way. Digital data now occupies the sky, replacing the flying aircrafts. The pandemics had let us have a foretaste 
of what the world will be like in the future. Do you think the mentality and lifestyle of mankind will remain the same as before, especially after this huge catastrophe? We know it will never be the same. Perhaps you may take the stand that you won't change. You might insist on your way of living and working style. You do not want to change your business operation. This is fine. No one will force it on you. Yet, society will not pause for anyone. Brothers and sisters, the year 2030 is already at our doorstep. We are now facing a totally new world, waiting eagerly to reveal itself. What can we do to better prepare ourselves and the church to face the challenges? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. In truth, there have been other times in history which has changed us forever. As a Christian, the most significant one is the movement from Palm Sunday to Resurrection. It began with the old norm on Palm Sunday, a day of great celebration and hope. The people had a particular pictures of what the hope should be and look like. But this resulted in Good Friday, when Christ was crucified. To the disciple, this felt like a total disaster and catastrophe. Life has changed forever. But then, resurrection happened. God changed our ideas of what the old norm was and defeated sin and death forever. Disciples' life has changed forever. Let us not keep thinking of going back to pre-COVID norm. But how can our Christian faith help us develop a post-COVID imagination for the new form, for the new norm? Let us be vigilant. We reverend and awe, let us continue to seek God's direction and His will during this pandemic period. Second, it's a reflection on the crucials of church premises. The crucials of church premises bring us back to the fundamental questions. What is church? Does the church refer to the buildings? Is online church service considered a formal service like what we have in the sanctuary? Is small group meeting conducted online considered a proper small group meeting? Is gathering online for event considered fellowship? Is the online community considered the church body? If no, then how can we define them? Can we use pay now to do Eve offering? Or is it offering only valid when we give fiscal offering in a century? If there's no physical congregation of people, where is the church? And the question go on. Before COVID, we would be occupied running church activities, one Sunday service after another, one special event after another. We have equated church premises and activities to be the same as church. The pandemic wiped up all this unexpectedly. And we realize 
we were not able to react swiftly to cope with the change. Personally, this sudden pause and slowing of momentum has brought in positive consequences. It allowed us to quiet down and take an honest evaluation of how we view church. Helping us to see a clearer picture of our circumstances. It has allowed us to refocus, perhaps removing burdens that were accumulated over the years in order to focus on the essential that the church needs to do. The Great Commission set by our Jesus Christ, as well as the social holiness and sanctification that were emphasized in the Methodist movement by our founder, John Wesley. What is the church? What is the purpose of the church? I think we all remember Jesus gave us the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And he said to make disciples of all nations. And that is the fundamental purpose of the church. The church is to make disciples and to spread the gospel to the end of the world. When we implemented central pooling for the conference last year, we also emphasized the calling that Jesus has for the church to fulfill the Great Commission. Hence, the direction is set for the conference is to be a disciple-making conference. Imagine that we are on a tour to a factory. The person in charge brings us into the magnificent building, sharing with you the amount of material they use to construct the factory how they overcame difficulties they had, but they do not show us the production line. I'm sure we will be disappointed because the purpose of factory tour is to allow people to learn about their manufacturer's product, their production line, and how they ensure high quality and consistency so that visitor and consumer will have confidence in their products. If this is done, not only will they purchase the products for themselves, they will also recommend them for others to use. The church is not a factory, but it has products. That is disciple of Jesus Christ. The assistant of the church is not about a visible structure, the church exists solely because of the Great Commission. Thus, even we are not able to gather in church sanctuary to worship, we are still the church because we are the people of Great Commission. We will continue to share the gospel and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Third, I want to share is that people need the Lord. The coronavirus pandemic has revealed how fragile and short life is. Despite the advancement in our medical technology, we were at loss with handling of the virus. We need a whole global community to mobilize resources and energy to contain the spread of the virus and to develop vaccines. We have come to realize that what we used to depend on is so vulnerable. The security that the world has is unreliable. Then on whom can we rely on? Where is the real peace? How can I face the future? What is the meaning of life? Many questions about life 
and purpose resurface in our mind. The shrinking of economy, closures of companies, retrenchment, family dispute, emotional issue, it all seem to come one after another. When people are feeling anxious, who can give them the living home? Who is willing to share the gospel with them? Their brother and sister. People need the Lord. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Our forefather in the faith, John Wesley, met the poor on their own terms and experienced firsthand the shocking condition in which many live. He preached over 40,000 sermons and traveled over 400,000 kilometers on horseback. This was because he knew that faith in God had major implications for human life and the well-being of human society. God loved everyone. Not a single person was excluded. All could therefore be saved, and all should be offered God's forgiveness, which was their true Christ Jesus. To say we believe in such a God is at the same time to commit to put this vision into practice. Wesley preached to the poor wherever and whosoever they were, because he believed himself to be doing nothing more than bearing witness to the truth of the gospel. I'm coming to the end of my sermon. The COVID-19 pandemic has profoundly impacted our life, leaving us astonished. But have we regained our composure to stand firm in our faith? Have we recalibrated our life goals? Have we reprioritized our life? Do we see the huge harvest before us that Jesus is preparing for his worker to reap? Do not misinterpret my message that I'm calling for more to be pastor or missionaries. I'm calling all citizens of God's kingdom to stand up and answer the call of the Great Commission, to be the ambassador of the gospel wherever you are at, and to make disciples before the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you are willing, may I encourage you to stand in response. And I will pray for you. If you are willing, may I encourage you to stand in response. And I'll pray for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your love. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for your amazing grace that we can receive the salvation 
and be called your children. Thank you for your resurrections. Thank you for giving us the Great Commission. I want to pray for those who stand up. May you grant them faith and courage. With your wisdom, they will stand up for you in wherever they are. Protect them and guide them in all their efforts to be your light and salt in the world. I also pray for those who did not stand up physically, but in the heart. I pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.